latest trilogy of Halloween films has come to an end with the appropriately titled Halloween Ends. So today we're gonna stop and rank all 13 Halloween films from the worst to the best. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Manscaped offers the best tools and liquid formulations for the three big odor zones, your body, your butt, and your balls. Manscaped hooked me up with the all-in-one performance package 4.0, so let's check it out. First up is the Lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer. This is Manscaped's fourth generation electric waterproof trimmer, so you can take it in the shower with you without being electrocuted. <laughs> It has advanced skin safe technology, which reduces nicks and cuts. So you don't like Michael Myers, the more sensitive parts of your body. And it can hold a charge for up to 90 minutes. And if it takes you 90 minutes to uh, groom your body, shave, that's quite impressive. Also included are two products I wasn't looking for, but I'm so glad that I found. The Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver is a convenient spritz with cooling aloe vera for whenever you need a pick me up. Unfortunately, there will be no video of me applying these two products. For a limited time, you get all of this plus two free gifts. Go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts when you use promo code Sean Chandler at checkout. Always use the right tool for the job. That's what Manscaped is for. The link is down below in the description and let's get started. Easily in last place, Halloween Resurrection, a terrible concept for a Halloween movie with possibly the worst imaginable conclusion to Laurie Strode's character arc. As a matter of fact, it was. It's one of the worst examples of a producer caring more about making money than honoring the legacy of the franchise and the characters. So based off the first 15 minutes alone, it would probably be in last place. But from there, we just get this totally generic early 2000s slasher film with a Halloween skin placed around it. In the screenwriter's Taking Shape interview, that's a book about the making of the Halloween franchise, he openly admitted that this was an idea that he just had for a movie that he thought was interesting of what if people thought they were in a fake situation for reality television, but then it turned out was real, which is kind of an interesting idea for a film in and of itself. A little bit generic. They did a lot of stuff like that back 20 years ago, but... As a Halloween film, it doesn't match the tone, the atmosphere, the vibe at all. And worst of all, we killed off Laurie Strode so that we could follow around all of these characters we do not care about as at all as they're slowly killed off by Michael Myers on reality television. And then adding insult to injury, the hero of the franchise is killed by Michael Myers in the first 15 minutes, but these idiots are able to defeat him? Give me a break, that's a bunch of malarkey. And Buster Rhymes defeats Michael Myers using karate he learned by watching movies? And Michael Myers is defeated by having his balls electrocuted. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Number 12, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, or Rob Zombie's Requiem for a Dream. Now, Rob Zombie's Halloween films are kind of a frustrating batch because I can respect his auteur take on the material. I appreciate that he has such a clear, singular vision for the franchise, but that doesn't mean that I enjoyed his films or got anything out of them. No, don't like that. Mr. Zombie seems dead set on just telling relentlessly bleak, abrasive, and unpleasant stories. Everyone is awful, everything they do is awful, and then they die horrible, horrible deaths. This movie seems designed to shock people that found his first movie a little bit too tame. I mean, the movie kicks off with the ambulance drivers talking about how they're turned on by the naked bodies of the teenage girls brutalized by Michael Myers. Then they start talking about how one of their co-workers in the field 
sometimes bangs the dead bodies and how they're tempted to do the same thing. Ew. And that's what makes these movies so unpleasant for me. Even when ambulance drivers are just talking to each other, it's disgusting and creepy conversations about pedophilia and necrophilia. People can't even talk without it being distasteful. I get that Zombie wants to make horror movies horrifying, but they have to be entertaining at the same time. And I'm not sure that like a grindhouse slasher is the best context to explore PTSD. So this movie is trying to show the aftermath of the previous film. So we see Laurie Strode in just constant meltdown mode. At no moment in time is she given any time to be normal and balanced then you have Loomis who's just turned into this insufferable douchebag that's trying to capitalize and make money selling his story and it doesn't in any way feel like a natural continuation of who he was in the previous film that's what every single thing in this movie it's just in bad taste and you get a few great moments in there. Brad Dorf is the one likable character, gives a great performance, but everything else just feels like this unpleasant schlog where everyone makes horrible choices and then they die a horrible death. Next up, Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. I did watch both versions of the film in preparation for this video and wrote notes on each of them. Either way, it shows up essentially the same spot in this ranking. At best, I feel that this was an ill-conceived premise for a Halloween movie designed to answer questions I wasn't asking with answers that I don't think are in any way compatible with the established lore. Whether Michael Myers is the pawn of a cult or the fulfillment of a prophecy, either way, those seem like violations of the entire Halloween series and its premise. From there, the killing of Jamie just seems like an incredibly stupid decision that's both an audience and character betrayal and makes her arc one of just like the cruelest and meanest in cinematic history. Whether she's killed in the first 15 minutes after being held captive and raped for years, or if she makes it halfway through the film and is killed while dreaming about her uncle raping her while she's underage, either one of these just feel like the most unpleasant and least satisfying ways to kill off this character. Well, that was disgusting. Worst ending ever. The theatrical cut is mostly incoherent and just feels like it throws a bunch of ideas at the screen, doesn't resolve any of them, and it leads to this incoherent mess of a third act. This is a mess. None of these storylines make any sense. The producer's cut makes more sense. It's more coherent, but it's still a bunch of ideas ideas that I don't think at all fit with the Halloween franchise, and it introduces the worst idea in the entire franchise that Michael Myers is Jamie's pedophile rapist uncle. Ew. And while its third act makes more sense, it leads to a final showdown where Paul Rudd puts rocks on the ground and then mispronounces Samhain. Now, it's fun to see Paul Rudd in his first film. Even if it is his worst and creepiest performance, but there's just not much here that I enjoy. We're left with two compromised versions of an already flawed premise. Kicking off the top 10, Halloween ends. And this movie for me was a gigantic swing and a miss. And it made it very clear to me that the creative team behind this trilogy of Halloween films simply did not have a trilogy's worth of ideas. I got a bad feeling about this. And instead had to pad out Halloween kills with characters making unbelievably stupid decisions and making Michael Myers indestructible. And this movie had to pad out almost its entire runtime with a story about a brand new character. Not a great plan. And in order to do that, we have to introduce a whole bunch of new mythology and new lore. And all of it just feels like the creators spinning their wheels, delaying the inevitable showdown between Michael Myers and Laurie Strode. 
None of what happens in the first hour and 20 minutes really matters at all when it comes to the final 20 minutes. It's just a bunch of stuff happening. And I honestly couldn't believe what I was seeing in the theater. Out of the blue, once again, as they close out one of these Halloween timelines, they introduce now like fantastical elements where Michael Myers looks into a guy's eyes and either sees the evil in him or passes the evil over. And we tell a story about this other guy killing people for like 45 minutes just to kill him off before the third act and have Michael Myers show up for the throwdown at the end. I mean, just on a basic story construction, all the setup at the beginning has nothing to do with the finale and the resolution. The finale and resolution of this movie could have come on Halloween Kills. You could just cut this, super cut it onto Halloween Kills, and both of those movies are suddenly better. This ending is better, and that movie is better if you do that. As is, you have a movie that spends all this time with Corey, and with his backstory and his transformation, it goes absolutely nowhere. It does nothing to really change Allison or Lori. It's just a waste of time for an hour and 20 minutes. And then we get the actual showdown that they teased in the trailers. That's not how you close out a trilogy. That's not how you tell a story. This feels once again like an example of producers trying to figure out how do we stretch this out for as long as we can. And in doing so, they compromise the integrity of both kills and ends. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Number nine, Rob Zombie's Halloween. As a point of reference, I watched the director's cut with the rape escape, and I don't believe I've ever seen the theatrical cut of this film. Much like Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, this is a frustrating watch for me because I think think it is an interesting reinterpretation of the classic John Carpenter film, whereas John Carpenter's film treated Michael Myers as this shape embodying evil with no motivation, Zombie humanizes Myers, gives him this whole backstory, makes him a sympathetic character that makes his actions far more unsettling and disturbing because we feel bad for him at the same time as he's killing all of these people. To his credit, Zombie managed to take this familiar story, do a faithful retelling of it, but at the same time turns it on its head with all the details and making it a character study about Michael Myers and how this perfect storm created this monster. On paper, I really like the idea of Rob Zombie's film. In execution, however, Yikes. Some things should work, but do they? I don't know why, but Zombie seems dead set on making all of his characters unbelievably nasty, crass, cruel, and all of the dialogue is just so intense and abrasive, so much so that when Laurie Strode is introduced, which is 55 minutes into the movie, she's making like crass sex jokes to her uh, adopted mother where she's like demonstrating penetration with a bagel. Why? Add to that, the movie has an uncomfortable amount of flippant rape and sexual violence to a degree that it's difficult to not describe the movie as just gross. And I know in, in real life, Danielle Harris was pushing 30 when she made this movie and she's five years older than me in real life. But of all the actresses to cast as the girl that runs around naked while covered in blood while being brutalized by Michael Myers, did you have to cast the girl famous for being the little girl in this specific franchise? That's just a weird choice. While I can respect some of the ideas in execution, Zombies films are just so relentlessly unpleasant that I just can't enjoy them. Then we have Halloween 5, a movie that constantly subverts expectations exclusively at its own cost. You thought that Jamie was gonna be the killer in this movie because that's what was set up and teased at the end of the previous film. Nope! We're gonna subvert expectations and just have Michael Myers return and start killing people. 
I have no idea what they were thinking, but it's like they constantly sabotaged themselves for the sake of just not doing what people thought they were gonna do. Why, 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 why would they do this? So fan favorite Rachel is just killed off flippantly at the beginning of the movie. No one even realizes she's dead. No one really reacts to her death and she's replaced with Tina. You've made a huge mistake. Tina is sort of the lead of the middle act of this movie but she's irritating and obnoxious, and she's not given any sort of character arc, depth, or motivation. She's just kind of like drifting through the story as a character who literally pranks the police officers on Halloween night with a Michael Myers mask a year after he massacred people. And then as soon as she becomes aware of the plot going on around her, she dies. Like she serves no purpose in the story. Nothing that she does actually matters, but she's kind of the lead throughout the middle of the film. Then they give like a psychic link between Jamie and Michael that seems to violate the rules of the franchise. And Loomis, his paranoia and his energy has now turned into basically berating a little girl where he's essentially abusive here. Because that's what heroes do. Now, despite all my complaints about the film, it does deliver a classic Halloween experience of Michael stalking people, killing a bunch of people, and you get one of Loomis's best lines ever. I prayed that he would burn in hell, but in my heart, I knew that hell would not happen. Number seven, Halloween 2. Now, this is one that hasn't aged all that well with me, and I feel like each time I rewatch it, I like it a little bit less. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. I think it works best if you watch it back to back with the original one, where it just continues that Carpenter vibe, that early era of the franchise with a young Jamie Lee Curtis. You have Loomis uh, with his ever fun personality, but getting more and more panicked as the movie goes along. It's a nice little touch. And as kind of the slasher genre had been exploding in the early 80s, it cranks up the gore and the violence to kind of catch up with some of those other franchises. The body count is always bigger. The death scenes are always much more elaborate. More blood, more gore. But also, since it doesn't have quite as strong of a story, it's not quite as tension-based, it adds a little bit more entertainment value with the amped up kills. But each time I rewatch this movie, the more I notice the stuff that kind of bugs me about it. First off, Laurie Strode just doesn't really have much to do in the film. She's in a hospital bed and drugged for most of the movie's runtime, totally unaware of what's going on. Second off, like Michael Myers wandering around in a hospital just isn't nearly as interesting as him stalking high school girls. And finally, I, I've just never really been crazy about the sibling twist because it wasn't set up at all in the previous movie or even in the first half of this movie. It just feels like it comes out of nowhere and it's actually very easy to miss it if you're not paying attention to the movie. It's just kind of like this thing that's dropped with huge gigantic ramifications. And John Carpenter himself has said he regrets the decision. So this is a movie that I feel like the fans, the audience have actually been kinder to it than the creatives behind it. And I think Halloween 2 is, is an abomination and a horrible movie. I was really disappointed in it. Can imagine my dismay when the script came back to me and I read it, I, I just hated it. I personally, was not too pleased with the script when I got it. It was pedestrian, it was predictable. So it's just fascinating the way that it's far more beloved by the audience than by the creators. In sixth place is Halloween Kills. Your enjoyment of this film is probably tied to the mileage you get out of watching Michael Myers unbound by rules and logic, just destroying people. Carnage candy. This whole movie feels like a frustrating mix of good ideas, bad ideas, gnarly kills, and terrible execution. It's got a little bit of everything. And since I go to these movies wanting to watch Michael Myers destroy people, I can have a lot of fun with it, but it's very much, you just have to suspend so much disbelief. You just have to turn off your brain too much with this movie. So it's very frustrating on a lot of different levels. I actually really like the idea that the town itself 
would have a memory of Michael Myers. So when he returns, they come back with this vengeance and form this lynch mob to destroy him. And they're just riv- driven by rage and stupidity. I like that idea. And that some of what they would do would get themselves killed, that they would get innocent people killed. All of those to me are really good ideas. The way that's executed, the way it actually plays out in the movie, not quite as good as the idea itself. There's just like stupid things like that that make absolutely no sense. And then there's a bunch of carnage candy that I also thoroughly enjoy. The idea of them, the mob leading to the death of an innocent mentally ill person. I think that's actually a good idea. It's an interesting idea showing the consequences of mob rule. Showing that person fall on the ground and using that as one of your moments for just watching the carnage candy, that's kind of in really poor taste. And then because they decided to make this a trilogy of films and not ending with this movie, they just have to give Michael Myers insane amounts of plot armor. To where between this movie and the last one, he's shot like seven times in the chest. His hand is blown off with a shotgun. He's stabbed. He's run over by a car. He's hit in the head with a bag of bricks. And then he's hit in the head with a baseball bat. And like the Energizer Bunny. Still going. Nothing outlasts the Energizer. They keep going and going. He just keeps going and going and going, nothing knocks him down. Nothing can stop him because he can't die in this movie. We got to do one more movie. And I just feel like they compromised this movie for the sake of making a trilogy. This is where it should have ended right here. Let the mob kill him, but they decided not to do that. Next up, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. And this is a film that's taken me a long time to come around on because... Michael Myers isn't in it. And when I show up to a Halloween movie and Michael Myers isn't in it, I'm very disappointed. This is one of the strangest franchise sequels of all time. And it's incredibly difficult to rank a movie like this because it's so radically different from every other movie in the franchise. One of these things is not like the other. As you're probably aware, after Halloween 2, they decided to make this an anthology series, in which case you get this invasion of the Body Snatchers-esque thriller involving these android agents trying to track down people who are trying to reveal this conspiracy about a mask company releasing masks with microchips in them with chips made from Stonehenge that are going to kill children as part of this Samhain ritual. It is weird. It is wild. It is crazy. It is so utterly different from the rest of the movies in this franchise. I take no responsibility for Halloween 3. The decision not to use the Michael Myers character was stupid. It's not a slasher film. It's sci-fi fantasy horror paranoia thriller all mixed up into one. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. On its own terms, it's interesting for just being so different, creative, and original. As a Halloween film, well, it is not a Halloween film at all. It just doesn't have any of the distinctives of the rest of the franchise. And so uh, I don't know where to put it, but I'm trying to rank them at least this year based off just how well do I think it does what it's trying to do? How enjoyable is it on its own terms for what I want from the movie, judging it on its own terms? And uh, this one works well enough for what it is. As a Halloween film, very odd. In fourth place, we have Halloween for the return of Michael Myers. And this one has aged really well with me. Now, I hadn't seen this film until about five years ago. For whatever reason, I'd always kind of had this weird bias against this era of Halloween films. And the more and more I rewatch this film, the more I like it and think that is a solid Halloween film. And now looking back on it, I just remember the good stuff. Now, right out of the gate, you have to be able to accept a few things. First one, that Loomis and Michael Myers survived Halloween 2. Second, that the entire franchise revolves around the 
sibling twist from Halloween 2, a twist that I'm not crazy about, but I think actually works pretty well in this movie. And third, you just have to be able to accept that they killed off Laurie Strode in a car accident off screen. Now, it follows the formula of the original pretty closely with Michael escaping, returning to Haddonfield, but the difference is that the town itself has changed. They remember what he did 10 years prior. So when Loomis shows up, the police actually believe him. They take him seriously. A mob forms to hunt down Michael Myers and it starts to sort of descend into chaos a little bit, but your plot points that are repeated in Halloween Kills, but not quite as well. I very much appreciated that the police officer, uh, Captain, wasn't a moron. He's helping Loomis from the get-go. I appreciated that the lynch mob kills an innocent person on accident, but are also pivotal in the escape in the third act of the film. And so it allows people to have multiple layers to them. It's not as dependent on the thrills and the building of tension. It's much more action-based, but as a person that likes action... I'm actually very much okay with that. So for me, this is a really solid Halloween sequel that delivers what I want from a Halloween film. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comments section. Let me know your ranking of all 13 Halloween movies. My list isn't the right list. It's just my list, and I would love to see yours. Also, remember, I've done a ton of other horror rankings just like this one. Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, Conjuring, Hellraiser, Saw, and many, many, many more. Evil Dead. You can check them all out right up here in this playlist when this video is over. In third place, Halloween H2O. After the franchise started to get really bogged down in mythology with the Thorn trilogy, this was a nice refresh of the whole franchise that brought back Jamie Lee Curtis to do a big final showdown between Laurie Strode and Michael Myers, and I am all here for it. Likewise, this is very much the screamification of the Halloween franchise, and I can understand why for a lot of people that's a big, gigantic negative. For me, the Kevin Williamson era of horror films, those were the formative years for me. I was in high school while the original trilogy of Scream films were coming out, and the faculty. That's my horror language and so I'm totally fine with a Halloween movie that's in that vibe. So good. Another nice touch about this movie is the casting. Now obviously you have Jamie Lee Curtis returning but a bunch of our teenagers in this movie were nobodies when they were cast and they went on to have these big successful careers. The movie has a very simple straightforward setup but that's really what Halloween movies are supposed to do, where you have Michael return, and instead of adding a bunch of complexity to the plot, they build tension in individual scenes, whether the one where the woman's in the bathroom and Michael walks in to steal her keys, or the part where the teenagers are running and they drop their keys, and they're trying to desperately find them to be able to get through a door in time before he catches them, it actually puts you on the edge of your seat, building that tension. And then most importantly, there's something just very satisfying about having a Halloween movie that doesn't build to a cliffhanger, but that builds to a final showdown with a definitive conclusion. Laurie Strode gets her revenge and defeats Michael Myers after pummeling him multiple different ways and then cuts his head off. It's such a satisfying, cathartic conclusion that a Laurie Strode who's been running and afraid for 20 years decides to stand her ground, fight back, and is victorious. She cuts off his head, she wins. You did it! Congratulations! Until the next movie undoes all of it. You blow it! You blew it. Our runner-up, Halloween 2018, and I thought this was a great legacy sequel. In a lot of ways, it is rehashing a number of the beats from the original Halloween, while at the same time updating all of the aesthetics, the vibe, and we're seeing our characters in a very different place in life. And I, I love it when movies do that, where you get to see them throughout decades and gr how they've grown, how they've changed. And it's one of the reasons I enjoyed Halloween H2O, and it's one of the major reasons I enjoyed this film, where you see this Laurie Strode who's barely functional at 60 years old, and she was a bad mother, but at the same time, 
she wasn't wrong in her preparing. And her preparing allowed her daughter to survive with what goes down in this film. And it creates a scenario where you can have this satisfying throwdown between Michael Myers and a 60-year-old woman that feels believable. That's great! They can have twists, turns, big, gigantic payoffs, some great, satisfying moments in it without straining all that much credibility. She might not have been a great mother, but she was right to prepare her daughter for this battle. It's also a movie that's really good at building tension in individual sequences. It just has this great ambiance where you feel the danger and you know something bad's going to happen, and the movie's brutal enough to allow certain vicious things to happen right there in front of you. It's so close to almost being, for me, better than the original film, except it makes just a couple of terrible mistakes that knock it back. We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. First off, there's just some really awkwardly placed humor in the movie that just cuts the tension at totally wrong times. In particular, the sequence with the babysitter and the little kid. This should be terrifying, edge of your seat, and they cut the tension with a little joke in the middle of it. Likewise, as we're approaching the final finale where ev all the tension should be ratcheted up, they cut to have this little bit with police officers like joking back and forth with each other, cuts the tension at just the wrong moment. And then New Loomis that I thought was a bad copy in the first half of the film and then just a really stupid idea in the back half of the film. And so that really knocked it back because I love so much about this film and it really does rival the original in a bunch of ways. But of course, in first place is John Carpenter's Halloween. This is a classic of the genre for a reason. While the basic synopsis and plot of the film is reminiscent of many other movies that came out around that same time, that's really John Carpenter's gift of taking these simple concepts and executing them with excellence. Awesome! From the very beginning, it establishes this unsettling tone. The first five minutes of the film plays essentially like a short film that works in and of itself while you follow this the camera into the house, watch something horrific take place, and then it has a twist reveal at the end that it was this innocent looking child all along. That sets the stage for this movie where you realize anything can happen and it's not afraid to go to very dark places. It's not complex. There's not a bunch of layers to it. It's fairly straightforward but it's effective. On so many levels, it's a restrained film. It doesn't have as big of a body count. There's not as much gore. And the combination of the cold open with this child killer combined with Loomis talking Michael up throughout the entire movie, it allows it to not need to have the carnage candy that you get in a bunch of the other sequels. It works on its own because you know just how dangerous Michael Myers actually is. And I really do think that Donald Pleasance as Loomis is so much of the secret sauce of this film where he's able to add a certain amount of prestige to this film and takes moments of exposition and elevate them on this whole other level with the way he delivers these eloquent monologues. His desperation just adds this energy and urgency to the entire film. But it's those little details that make all the difference here, that elevate this movie above all of its copycats. I like it a lot. That John Carpenter knew how to be restrained while still delivering tension. He knew how to build excitement and urgency, stakes and danger without needing to just amp up the gore and the carnage. It's a great example of how to do it right. It's simple, but it's excellent. It comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, I've got more like it right over there in that playlist. I've ranked almost all of the major horror franchises. Also remember, if you're trying to take good care of your body, consider checking out Manscaped at the link down below in the description. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.